things that I think are going to last, that are going to be intrinsically safe, and they're not, not going to be dependent on a grid operating. Yeah. And that's, it's, it's, it's so funny because it's people's just lack of experience and understanding with gardening. $200. Like, I mean, you, that thing you've got, what's the dimensions? Is it 30 by 40? No, it's tw 20 by 40. What is your green 20 by 40. Yeah. 800 square feet. I mean, shit. I mean, I would be able to grow in a growing season. I mean, in, in 800 square feet, at least with, for me doing what I've done, at least $8,000 of food in that, in that greenhouse in a growing year, at least. Uh, and, and really more because you'll be able to extend the season. You can layer things. There's, there's so much you can do. If people get hung up on the dollar amount, you're already kind of in the woods. Like you're, you're gone. Like it, you, you can't think about that in this way. You have to, to be practical and how you're going to make an investment. But this is, as you said, insurance is a, is a really good way to think about it. Um, and that, so what you said there is really interesting because yes, if you just quantify the numbers based on dollars and assume certain things like you're tied into the grid and then that grid is always going to prov provide for you. Sure. Making the case for the blower as I have is great here at my house. That's what I've got. Um, you know, actually our, our grid has gone down. Actually we have our, our Tesla battery system here and it was quite neat. Uh, on Halloween, we had this crazy power out that knocked out a big chunk of the city and my house didn't even blip. And so that, that, that fan kept running all of that stuff. It was kind of cool to see that. Um, but I think you're right, man, in an off grid context, like you said, if you, if you need to spend another $6,000 on solar infrastructure to hook that up, um, and then knowing that that's always going to be a constant draw, there's, there's going to be times in the year when you're off grid where, there's so many more valuable things that you could put energy towards that making that. Cause you, you, you said it was eight. That was it eight grand to get the polycarbonate on that greenhouse Rob. Yeah, it was actually about six. And then the, I could have got it for way less. Actually. I, I screwed up and that I, I tried to get, I did six foot wide stuff instead of four foot wide. And that allowed me to um, put my trusses at three foot intervals instead of two foot intervals. Oh, um, and the reason that I wanted to do that was to increase the amount of, um, solar energy that I can get. Like you can imagine if you got trusses two feet apart, that's pretty tight in a greenhouse. It's pretty tight. And yeah. so three feet makes a big difference. Um, but in order to do that, I had to get six foot wide poly, which is great. I love it. It's beautiful stuff, but I had to pay 1500 bucks to have it shipped because it took up two skid spaces on a truck right. times 24 feet. Right. So how, uh, how would you have, what would you have done to mitigate that cost then? I, I probably would go back to two foot centers. Really? Um, yeah, I think so. Just, I mean, it's, it's a, it's a pretty steep premium um, for, for a six foot panel. So I, you could go either way, but it's, it is beautiful. Like is if you could call polycarbonate beautiful, this stuff's pretty beautiful. It's nice. How long are those trusses from the top of the roof to the, to the knee wall? 20 feet? 24. So, so those are, those are, those are, are those two by six, two by six by 24? No, two by 12. Two by 12. Beautiful wow. fur, clear fur. And, um, and we cut in the, the two by four purlins. It's, it's gorgeous. Wow. What, what, what do you think about using steel in that context? Oh yeah, it's great. I mean, uh, the but, only but a lot is, more expensive. Uh, I don't know. I, I mean, those, those actually, they probably would be more expensive. Those two by 12s are only a hundred bucks each. Um, which surprised me. Um, so steel would be good, but you're going to get condensation on steel. So you have to make sure you paint it so it doesn't rust. That's right. Yeah. But I wonder if you, you cause, cause a two, a two by six is one and a half inches thick, correct? Two by 12. Yeah. One and a half. By, yeah. yeah. So, but I, if you use steel, would you be able to go one inch channel? Um, well, you'd probably use an open web steel member. And so it would basically be two, um, two cords and then you'd have basically like a trellis on the inside. Um, and so the light would come through that. And so steel would be great. Like you can, you can get great, uh, it's super strong. It can be quite a bit, the web can be quite a bit shallower. Yeah. Uh, they'll last forever. You just have to paint them. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, all right. So 419 people watching now guys, reminder to subscribe to raw Ben Dakota on YouTube. I've got their links in the, in the show notes there. So this one I think is kind of directed at all of us um, from Peter. Three questions for dealing with wet land. 
Uh, Dakota's got quite a bit of wetland on his property, so he might shed a lot of light on this one. Um, my property contains and is adjacent to wetlands, largely flat with one gully that turns into a stream and with, with wet weather. 10 inches of topsoil uh, with sand soil underneath. Water table is very high. One, how to manage wet suits on flat wetsuits how to manage wetsuits on flat ground on flat ground from a uh, form that form after rain i'm considering a combination of deep wood chip pathways and raised beds uh for my main garden area two what trees slash bushes to plant to suck up excess water i'm looking at planting willow trees in a couple of spots cedar hedging that could use guidance on uh, bushes that like to suck up water. And then three suggestions for managing mosquitoes. I'm already teaming with frogs and I'm thinking of throwing up some bathhouses. So could you, could you go through those, those three things again? It was uh, how, how to manage wetsuits. Wet, wet spots, I think. Wet, maybe, yeah, wet spots on, on flat ground uh, that form after rain. Yeah. Um, and he's considering wood chip pathways and raised beds. Uh, to what trees and bushes that suck up excess water. Uh, he's looking at doing some willow and some spots and some cedar. And then uh, suggestions for managing mosquitoes. Mosquitoes. Okay. Uh, so <clears throat> the, um, the, the, the first thing, and, and you know, thank, thank goodness, uh, I, didn't, I didn't hear anything in the, the question that made it seem like it was like, how do I drain all this water away? Yeah, right. Because uh, that's, that's typically what we hear is, I, I, I bought a swamp and I don't want it to be a swamp. <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah. and so the, the, uh, Rob and I have this saying that uh, it's like, ch change, your, change your goals to fit your geography or change your geography to fit your goals. But um, like, don't, don't try to, and, and by change, I don't mean like modify the existing place. I mean, physically move somewhere else because you're, you're going to spend so much energy trying to turn, make your land be something that it doesn't want. So that's, that's the first thing, but it, it, it sounds like he, he's already thinking uh, like that and trying to, how do I, you know, kind of work with the land. So in terms of the wet spots, um, uh, I mean, like one option would be like, it's like, could you actually make them like more wet? Like, you know, uh, uh, make more, more ponds or some, some kind of, of uh, uh, you know, connect them together with, with a swale or something like that and, and plant them to cattails or some kind of a productive plant that would do really, really well there. Uh, and then figure out, uh, you know, probably your, his biggest challenge is just access through those areas. And so this is where, like on my property, and uh, if, if you check out some of the, the drone tours that, um, that I've done and Chris has done as well and, and Rob of our property, uh, uh, we, I chose really strategic locations to cross my kind of wetland areas and I built dams across those areas so I'd have a really good high access way. But then I also backed up a bunch of water so that I had a really good dam, but now I can actually flood, you know, I can using a monk pipe, which is just a... Uh, like a, a 90 degree elbow, uh, whatever diameter pipe you want to use. I use six inch because it's kind of the biggest you can, you can manhandle by yourself. And that allows me to actually to, to control the levels of water on either side of my, my dam and, and let it flow across my property. So <clears throat> that'd be my thing is just like, you know, find a really good access way, like, you know, get some topographical data if you can. Um, I don't know. It, do you know, did he say where he was, Curtis? Is he in the States or Canada? Um, doesn't say. Okay. Cause the, the, the regardless, Robin, uh, um, our, and ours, uh, uh, ContraMap generator is now live. So if you go to ContraMapGenerator.com, uh, you can, you can get a, a, a preview, a free preview of, of a ContraMap for anywhere in the world. So the data, it, it changes uh, the quality of the data it, it's it varies depending on where you are in the world so make sure it's it's good data before you buy it but um, from that you can you can figure okay here's where my ridges are uh, here's a good place to build a dam here's where I can you know do some water management stuff like that that's what I would I would personally focus on is is getting really good topographical data uh, in terms of trees and bushes that can help moderate that I, it sounds like he's right on the right track uh, you know, look at the ecosystem around you, figure out what's doing really, really well there, and then try to find analog species. So, you know, if you've got, 
Um, you know, if poplar is growing really well there, okay, maybe there's some cultivar poplars, some hybrid poplars, it'll grow faster. If, you know, you've got, uh, you know, certain kinds of uh, willows, again, maybe there's cultivar willows that can grow there, <clears throat> stuff like that. But also look into a lot of the uh, aqu aquatic plants, like the more, um, the, uh, what are they called? Uh, like herbaceous perennials, things like cattails, duck potato, you know, wild rice. We did a video on that at your place, Dakota. Yeah, exactly. Yep. It's like, like, or even like duck, duckweed is another thing that we grow in our place. There's, uh, or if, you, if depending on where you live in the world, aquaculture, like in, in terms of fish, is a very viable system. And so maybe like if you have this much water, maybe just digging more ponds using that clay or subsoil to build really good access roads so you don't have wet spots anymore. And then putting in, uh, if you can legally stock it with, with you know, some, some native fish in your area and, uh, and then put some you know, uh, trees and shrubs around that. There's, there's crazy systems like, um, for example, say you've got, uh, I, th I think, um, mulberries. Uh, I, I've heard uh, Bill Malson talked about this. So mulberries is a, is a tree that, uh, produces a ton of fruit and then they 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 attract a lot of insects and and one of them can be like uh, silkworms and so in in the the orient they actually plant these mulberries on the next to their aquaculture ponds overhanging the banks brilliant so that that these silkworms when they when they're eating all the fruit in the mulberry trees they drop off into the pond and they feed the fish that are in the pond so it's like are there any other you know uh plants that that could you know drop stuff into the into the pond to to feed those things and then for the mosquitoes uh one of the things i found really effective in in terms of uh ponds for my area is a, a species of fish called fathead minnows or uh, uh pimpofei uh, promelis is the the latin name and uh they're uh they're about two inches long two or three inches long and they're native everywhere in the world and they they thrive off of off of like algae and like mosquito larvae and stuff like that. And but they'll they'll grow in like in you know an inch of water that's like pure mud. Like they're super yep. hardy. And um, but like ducks is another one. Uh, but I mean, as um, uh, like a lot of times, like it's the sh the shallow water isn't really the the problem. It's actually like the wet grass and stuff like that. So that's where, you know, having, you know, grazing animals or some kind of a grass management program can be really helpful. And another thing that um, uh, I actually, uh, I can't remember where, where I heard this from recently, but uh, apparently, uh, what are they called? Uh, dragonflies. They are, uh, they're like a, a major predator of mosquitoes. And, and uh, cause they'll, the, the dragonflies, they, they prey on them in the water and in the air, because when the dragonflies are, are nymphs and they're kind of swimming around the water, they'll actually eat the eggs. And then when they fly around, they'll, they'll, they'll get them there too. Oh, wow. How, however, the, um, the, the problem with dragonflies is that they, they apparently they require like seven years of like healthy wetland in order for them to be able to breed properly. And so there's this kind of delay because mosquitoes are like this opportunistic species that can, you know, they can lay eggs and hatch within like a few weeks and and like and cycle their their numbers versus dragonflies take seven years to build their numbers up and so if you live like most places in the world where you've got degraded you know wetlands that the, the habitat for these predators takes longer to build up than than the pest species so you might it might take a while uh, before kind of things get back into the balance but um, like birdhouses a bit is a big one that we do uh, we, we try to incur it actually I had a crazy uh i didn't realize this but my my woodshed is filled with bats uh this year i i didn't i um i was trying to start a fire for um uh for like a like a campfire normally we don't do it and i went into my my woodshed and i pulled out a big arm and i heard this like this like screech and i had squished this this bat he was like living in the crevices of because i'd be like ah oh, for years i wanted to build all these bat houses turns out i've got like a, you know, 2,000 square feet of bat houses. And because um, they're, they're filled with uh, what I thought they were mouse droppings, like uh, mouse poop, because it looks the same. And I was like, oh, it's gross. And this whole woodshed is just filled with mice. Turns out it's just, they're full, filled with bats. 
Um, so that's something else. But yeah, like bats, birds, um, you know, wildlife habitat, uh, stuff like that. And then Rob, you were going to mention something about uh, chinampas in there as well. You did. Oh. The, um, the thing with aquatic systems is they're 28 times more productive than, than terrestrial ones. So when people have problems with, with water, they just have to get a little bit more creative. Um, and so some of the most productive um, agricultural systems on the planet are, are aquatic. The freshwater aquaculture book, is that it? Yeah. So the, um, the uh, which was, what was this, the, the tribe in Mexico that lived in Mexico City? I can't remember right now. The Aztecs, maybe? Um, anyways, they lived, they basically dug their, um, their wetlands out. So as Dakota was saying, they enhanced the depth of the water. And then they grew on these islands um, that they would uh, stake with, with willow trees. So you're, you're right on the right track with willow. Uh, um, and so you probably just need to increase the level of productivity on your property.